Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You've <clears throat> taken some of my very thoughtful and creative questions already, so uh, I'll be brief. Um, Mr. Schoen, or Dr. Schoenbach, uh, to follow up on, on Chairman Nye's question about um, transferring that technology to uh, businesses, part of the, um, the bill yesterday was the STTR provision, the Small Business Technology Transfer uh, Program. And I'm just wondering if your university is able to, or if you target businesses who may already participate in that program as potential customers for your inf for your technology that you're developing at the university. If there's a way for you to get that information mm -hmm. of recipients, in other words, of those entrepreneurs who are already um, involved with that, that are interested in taking the risk and, and developing the technology that a university like yours would use, uh, it would seem to me that that might be a good program to look at for potential yeah. Partners, I, I think definitely STTRs, and, and we have done several of them, are a good vehicle, I think, to bring certain projects to fruition. Uh, and SBIRs as well with subcontracts to the university. So this is a possibility, and that can be used. It doesn't work for all the projects. If you talk about these preclinical uh, studies, trials, and so on, they require, in my opinion, much more funding than is available through these STTRs. Uh, the other problem sometimes is with STTRs and SPRs, especially if you go to, let's say, the Department of Defense, is that you have to see what's available. That means you have to find a match first before you can start working on, on it. And uh, very often there is no match because, if, let's say, there is an innovation coming from a university. It might not have reached that state where somebody at DOD has made a decision this is worth funding. I mean, there is a certain delay then in all these procedures. But definitely, I think for many projects, this is a mm -hmm. very, it's an excellent program. And we have made uh, use of it several times. So the limitations on the program aren't so much in the way the rules are written, but as much in the grant r award sizes don't allow for some of the research. I, I th that's what my opinion is. And some of the, some of the projects require more funding. This is, so this is one obstacle, in particular if you go into biomedical mm -hmm. uh, applications. I think trials are, are probably very expensive. Uh, the, the other one is really uh, trying to bring as quickly as possible innovations to industry. And the way to do it is, for example, I go into the Internet and look at what is available at DOD. I'm an engineer, so this would be my first uh, thing to do, go into the website of DOD, and then I see and I look through all the different topics which are offered. And some of them might fit, but most of them will not fit if I do something which is really innovative. So I, if it requires some additional work, I think, to make people available, which takes time uh, mm -hmm. to do. So this is a matter maybe of involving the researcher more in the decision making about topics which are worth funding. And I don't know how this is done, so this could be a procedural thing. Sure. Okay. Um, Mr. Barrett, you mentioned in your, uh, in your testimony that um, in addition to the R&D tax credit, um, perhaps we could offer some incentives for um, what, I, what I would interpret as like an accelerated depreciation or some kind of incentive for the capital required for the R&D. Is that what you're thinking of as like an accelerated depreciation method for those investments, or do you have some specific ideas on on what we could do as a part of the R and D tax credit to help to help lessen the the um, the burden required for some of the more capital intensive research? Well, I think that um, you know more rapid depreciation would be a very good thing because in our business the the hardware becomes obsolete much more rapidly than one you know five years I think is the typical schedule, and uh, it can become obsolete within a year or two years depending upon the technology uses. So yeah, looking at that, I think a little bit more carefully would be warranted. Okay. And then uh, Mr. Bendis, uh, we talked about. Um, um, improving the R&D tax or research and development tax credit. I'm wondering if there are specific states that are exceptionally good at this or they have a better R&D than other states that we could model 
our legislation at or at least look to for ideas? As I mentioned, there are 38 states, and um, uh, a number of them have modeled their programs based on what the earlier states have done and tried to improve them. I know that New Jersey has done some modifications recently. Pennsylvania has a very aggressive program. Um, but I think it would be very easy, uh, and the State Science and Technology Institute, which is a technology-based economic development national association working with these kind of organizations in all 50 states, could very easily summarize for you in this committee what some of the best practices are and what some of the improvements have been made uh, as well as uh, the National Association of Seed and Venture Capital. We'd be glad to work with the committee to look at what some of the innovative things are that are occurring in the states that may benefit uh, this legislation as you're trying to either extend or make it permanent. And I don't know if it's too late, but, uh, but it's never too late to look at constant improvements, and I think that the platforms of innovation are really occurring in the state level. So how do you take advantage of some of the things that they've learned from best practices that can be incorporated at a federal level? Mm -hmm. And we'd be glad to work with you on that. Well, I don't think it's too late. I mean, that's why we're having the hearing, so we good. can get ideas and feedback and ways to improve. So very good. Thank you all for, for um, your traveling here and, and most importantly for uh, putting up with our very crazy schedule. Welcome to Congress. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Again, uh, I want to add my word of thanks, everyone, for, for spending this time with us and for sharing your expertise. You all are on the front lines here and, and see this uh, in execution every day, and it, it's our job to listen to you and then to try to make policy which reflects the reality of what's going on out in the economy. So well, thank you again. Um, I'm going to ask unanimous consent that members have five days to submit statements and supporting materials for the record. Uh, without objection, so ordered. This hearing is now adjourned. <laughs>